it is my great honor to introduce Crystal Lehman. For many of you, she needs no introduction. Um, she is a government relations advisor and treaty coordinator for the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. She uses her formal academic accomplishments of two degrees, but most importantly, her indigenous ways of knowing and being to articulate the damaging impacts of industry and resource extraction on her homeland. Crystal is also one of the drafters of the LEAP Manifesto, a call to build a Canada based on caring for the earth and for each other, and the bold pathway to achieve environmental, racial, and economic justice while addressing the climate crisis. And the LEAP Manifesto was actually a precursor to the Green New Deal, and which has become common parlance now, but it was uh, the first foray into that area of connecting uh, those issues together. So thank you, Crystal, for your work. And um, the floor is yours. I didn't realize I was going to talk. I thought I was just here to be here. <laughs> I'm actually not even kidding about that. Um, so this is off the top of my head, guys. But um, so greetings to each and every one of you. Um, I first and foremost want to um, just give uh, gratitude to um, to Beaver Lake's legal team, uh, more specifically uh, Carrie Brooks. Um, she's a very busy lady and, and was able to take time to be here. And, and thank you for that, Carrie. I really greatly appreciate that. Um, this is a really important matter. Um, you know, on top of Beaver Lake's overall cumulative impacts treaty rights case, um, but the advanced cost um, matter is this whole other added layer. And so I'm looking forward to hearing the way in which um, Carrie and guest will break down um, the advanced cost. Um, and then maybe maybe we'll be able to provide some comments about the way in which uh, the Supreme Court uh, hearing went uh, last week. That's already been a week almost. Um, and then you're right, uh, things have been really busy. Um, and so I, I didn't think I'd be able to make it. I had a treaty meeting today and, um, you know, because nonetheless, you know, as we uh, are challenging and, and having to, um, be faced with environmental concerns and and lands uh, resources etc um, at the same time you know there's ongoing um, infringements and violations against uh, overall our collective treaty rights so today um, we actually had a two-day meeting on our medicine chest uh, so the treaty number six is is one of the uh, is is the uh, the treaty that um, inserted the medicine chest clause when we entered into a treaty in 1876. And, and now that uh, is, um, is is one of the, the major matters that we're kind of dealing with at the forefront. So like I said, I didn't think I'd be able to make it, but here I am. I don't really have anything to add. Um, I'm just here to, to listen and to show support. Uh, thank you to Raven um, for your continued work. Uh, I give that, uh, I bring that to, from the nation, um, you know, without Raven's continued support, the support of our, our donors and fundraisers and, and every single person that even just shares a post, um, it, it, it really is um, the reason why we've been able to carry this case uh, forward uh, with, without that continued support, there's no way we would have made it this far. So I just want to uh, lift you all up and, and give you thanks. Um, that's it for now. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so very much, Crystal. And I can flip it right back to you without Beaver Lake Cree, there would be no Raven. You were the first case that we ever took on. And that was proof of concept that this kind of organization can actually serve some purpose to good in this world. So we thank you um, for kind of believing in us from the beginning. Um, I also want to introduce um, my colleagues who are here with me. I should have done that at the beginning. So we have here Susan Smith and our executive director, um, and also Carissa uh, Chandra-Kate, um, who will be helping uh, us with um, 
the questions and moder generally moderating uh, this webinar. She is part of our amazing communications team. So uh, thanks for being here. Um, and then we will pass the uh, mic on to Carrie Brooke, um, the legal counsel for Beaver Lake Cree, um, who acts from, she works for a company called JFK Law, and uh, she primarily acts for First Nations and First Nations organizations and court in court and in negotiations with government um, and industry on matters relating to Aboriginal rights. Um, Kerry has worked with Beaver Lake Cree Nation for several years, and it was her work that helped secure the first initial advance cost order of $600,000 for Beaver Lake Cree's Humongous Defender Treaties case back in 2019. Um, Carrie is widely recognized for the major contribution she has made to Aboriginal law and the legal profession generally. As lead litigation counsel, Carrie is recognized as a fearless advocate who has advanced a number of unique claims in pursuit of a legal remedy to the complex issues her clients face. Carrie, you're on. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to pile on to the to the gratitude that's been circulating uh, amongst everyone. So uh, first of all, just to Beaver Lake and the community, uh, to leadership. Um, I've been working with them, as Anna said, now since around 2015. And it really, people talk about, lawyers often talk about what an honor it is to, to work for their clients. And, and that is um, so true for Beaver Lake. It's just been such a incredible experience to be part of this with them and um and 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 again to to raven for really supporting um beaver lake and being able to bring this claim as far as it has uh and to all of the supporters who are listening um today um we really um appreciate deeply the contributions that everybody's made to allow this uh important lawsuit to to advance um as far as it has um, and so I thought what I would do just to bring everyone up to speed is just talk a little bit about the underlying litigation and, and then uh, talk about some of the events that led up to Beaver Lake's application for uh, advanced costs and, and talk a bit about what advanced costs are and when they're, um, when the court may entertain an application for advanced costs, what the conditions are that have to be met and then focus in on what the core issue was uh, in this particular application uh, that led the Supreme Court to, to hear it, to hear the matter. So Beaver Lake actually has brought two, two cases now of profound legal significance and public importance. One is the underlying litigation, and then the next one is the application for advanced costs itself was determined to be of, of public importance. So the underlying litigation, I'm sure, sure many of you know this, but um, really is about the core promise in, in the treaty relationship. And that is, that is truly foundational to, to our country. And um, Beaver Lake brought its claim in 2018. So it's been over a decade now since the claim was first brought. And when it did bring its claim, it was, uh, the first of its kind. There's been two other claims now that I'm aware of that have um, also brought similar claims, but Beaver Lake was the trailblazer to bring this initial uh, claim forward and, and looks squarely at what the core of this treaty promises. Um, and and um, specifically looking at the promises around a way of life and then what limits are on the crown when the crown is taking action that impairs or limits those rights. So the in the treaty, there's a clause that's referred to as the taking up clause that uh, the crown, although promised that the indigenous signatories could have and maintain their way of life, um, there would from time to time be a taking up of land. Um, for, for various purposes. Um, and so what Beaver Lakes claim is that the Crown uh, has taken up so much land, so much of their resources that they're now no longer able to meaningfully carry out their way of life and practice their culture and exercise the rights that were promised under the treaty. 
So it, the, the question that's raised in the claim is of um, profound significance, not only to Beaver Lake, but um, to all Canadians and really goes to the core of what these treaties, historic treaties mean and what the core promises are and what are the constitutional limits uh, on the Crown conduct when the Crown is um, exercising its taking up powers and developing the lands. Um, and it's significant because it, unlike other claims that may look at a treaty right or an Aboriginal right and looks at the restriction of one specific right, this is really looking at the potential of the, of the, of the complete destruction um, of the treaty promise itself. So it has really significant and severe consequences um, and makes this particular claim extraordinarily significant and important. Um, so the underlying litigation is, um, is complicated. When Beaver Lake first brought the claim, it faced multiple challenges that it wasn't even able to litigate the claim. And the Crown, and this is relevant to the cost issue because the Crown initially, when Beaver Lake brought it, said, this claim is so huge, it's so unmanageable um, it, that, we, that it's, you can't even litigate it. And, and it, it should be struck out on that basis. And Beaver Lake had to go through um, various applications to defend the, 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 the claim itself. And, um, and the Crown, and, and Beaver Lake was successful. The Crown um, lost those applications and, and the Court of Appeal said in 2014 in its decision that Beaver Lake is entitled to access to justice regardless of the scope of the Crown's wrongdoing. And that's significant because it is a case that's very complicated. And, um, and, and the court there, and I just underscore the access to justice point that the court made, because the court said Beaver Lake's entitled to its access to justice regardless of the scope of the Crown's wrongdoing. And, and so that was in 2014. So, the, so Beaver Lake's entitled to bring a claim that involves these complicated matters and that our courts have said must be heard on a full record. There's really no other way for Beaver Lake to bring this claim but through these expensive court proceedings that require significant marshalling of evidence, lots of expert reports, lots of questioning, tons of document disclosure. And the courts have been really clear that th this is not appropriate for any summary proceeding. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate, the courts have said, for Beaver Lake to engage in self-help, that Beaver Lake has to bring these claims. So um, a, on a full, full-dressed civil proceeding. Um, and so after the court says, yes, you, you know, you're entitled to your access to justice, then Beaver Lake confronts the next issue, which is paying for this costly litigation. Um, so, so, and this is not a, uh, this is a problem that's not unique to Beaver Lake. These Section Thirty Five claims are expensive, um, and <clears throat> to bring, and Beaver Lake, like many First Nations, has has really suffered from all, all the whole host of colonial policies that have sought to marginalize and uh, oppress Beaver Lake people. And Beaver Lake, as the case management judge noted, is, is, lives in undeniable poverty. And so Beaver Lake's faced with this crisis of seeing its treaty rights eroding um, and at the same time is unable to afford the costs of the litigation uh, in order to seek proper redress for these wrongs that the Crown has committed. So um, shortly after Beaver Lake exhausted significant funds and again with the support of Raven as well and, and Beaver Lake from the beginning uh, knew that the case was going to be costly and it engaged, uh, it tried a number of different ways to raise funds. Um, another, you know, initially out of the gate, it tried to secure pro bono counsel from a firm in England who was prepared to help uh, Beaver Lake, a firm that specialized in environmental 
uh, law and that uh, application was denied and the Crown fought them on that. And then Beaver Lake turned to Raven and they have been absolutely exhaustive in their fundraising efforts to try to raise money. And many of you have contributed and that's really appreciated. But these cases are, you know, cost uh, cost um, far more than could be raised privately um, to get heard. So Beaver Lake decided in 2017 when it was faced with the potential cost of the litigation being at least five million dollars for a trial. It's the trial is going to be 120 days at least, and will go probably take about a year, maybe even longer, for it to get heard. Over that time, there's going to be a number of expert reports. The Crown told us that they had gigabytes of documents, which is millions of documents. Um, and of course, the, the case is going to require a lot of community evidence and working with community to help develop that evidence. So it's a very resource intensive case. And Beaver Lake just didn't have the money, did not have the money to do that. And so it so we work, worked with Beaver Lake to bring this advanced cost motion. And um, advanced cost is a very special um, order that the courts can make. It's a really, it draws on the court's equitable jurisdiction. And it says that the courts can in very narrow and rare circumstances um, order that the defendants or here the governments pay costs of the litigation in advance. And the advance there is just referring to before a resolution. Um, and what we know is that at the end of a trial, costs are awarded usually to the successful party. Um, and so, but this, this is a, a separate um, exercise of the court's equitable jurisdiction to say that there may be some circumstances where um, the, it's in the interest of justice that the court order that the other side pay the legal fees to ensure this case gets heard. And there's strict conditions that apply when the court can do that. It includes uh, the, the case itself has to be meritorious. The case has to be publicly important. And the applicant here, the First Nation, has to be what the court says impecunious. And if those conditions are met, then the court has jurisdiction to our discretion to decide is this case special enough that the court will direct the defendants to pay the costs in advance. And why the courts are so hesitant and cautious about this is because it, the courts don't like to tell governments how to spend their money. And they see that that's part of the court's sort of separation of powers, that the governments get to decide how to allocate public funds, and that's not for the court to dictate. And so this, this is an area that the courts are generally concerned about making sure they don't overstep. And so the conditions that were set, and they were first set in um, 2003 in a case called Okanagan, and there was very similar in that it was, again, the Okanagan um, Indian band who was bringing an Aboriginal title case. And the court it, in that situation, the court looked at the cost of the litigation and recognized that there was no way that the bands could afford to bring the litigation forward and advance the matter to trial. And the court said this was an appropriate exercise of its equitable jurisdiction to order that the cost be paid in advance. And that case really focused on the jurisdiction of the court to make that extraordinary order. Uh, the courts below had concern about whether or not the courts even had the jurisdiction to do that. So the case focused on that, but there was in that case, the court did recognize in articulating those conditions that I talked about that had to be met, that in that case, it said the bands can't afford this litigation. And even if they had the money, and this is the key, they had many other pressing needs for those funds. And they talked about the housing and the unemployment conditions. And, um, and so the courts, um, so the court uh, there said that, um, that, the, that the litigation would have to have to go ahead, uh, or sorry, that the court would exercise its jurisdiction to require the defendants pay the costs of the litigation. Um, and 
And so that opened the door, it was the first door that was opened into this special situation where the courts may, in cases of public importance and significance, um, order that the cost be paid in advance. Now, since then, there hasn't been a lot of cases where the courts have found it appropriate to exercise this jurisdiction, but you may know of the Chilcolton case there, the court, that was, that was run on an advanced cost order. Um, in fact, there are multiple advanced cost orders. Uh, and same with Grassy Narrows or Kiwaitin, you may know that case as well. Um, that was a Treaty 3 case that looked at the jurisdiction of the province there, Ontario, um, and whether the province had the ability to exercise the, the treaty right, or sorry, the taking up powers under the treaty. Um, and so those are two examples of, of cases that have made their way up to the Supreme Court and did so on an advanced cost order. So in Beaver Lake's case, what happened is Beaver Lake uh, brought its application and the case management judge who had been the case management judge for seven years uh, heard the application and said that, uh, that Beaver Lake met the criteria and she exercised her discretion to order that the defendants, Alberta and Canada, contribute to the cost of the litigation, um, 300,000 each uh, a year until the trial, till the matter was resolved, um, either through trial or, or negotiations. Uh, so that gave Beaver Lake some concrete assistance in having its case heard. So about 600,000 um, a year. And just so, you know, I saw someone asking about costs and yeah, the costs are, you know, exorbitant. The, the Chilcolton trial alone, um, the, and there's multiple cost orders that deal with this, but, um, you know, it was 20 million. There's multiple lawyers that have to work on these files. There's hundreds of thousands of documents that have to be reviewed. There's multiple experts that have to be retained that have various expertise to look at um, to look at wildlife um, depletion and water quality and how the environment is being affected. And then there needs to be uh, reports from anthropologists to to interview the community to find out how their way of life and the way that they're exercising their rights has been impacted by the level of development. There's just a, in a whole com complex layers of, of, of folks that have to be involved in putting together the evidence for these cases. And then the, the trial days alone, um, having multiple um, lawyers um, involved in, in pushing these ahead, they're long trial days, they're complicated, they're difficult. Um, and uh, they're just very resource intense cases. Uh, and no one disputed that it would cost that much. In fact, the Crown said it would cost much, much more uh, than the estimate that, uh, that Beaver Lake had put forward. And in part, that was because the Crown said there was just millions of documents that had to be reviewed and sorted and understood and read and coded. and. Um, and that process alone, they said, was going to take years to, to, to get through. But there is a trial date, and the trial date's 2024. Uh, and so if the case is properly resourced, then, then we should be able to meet the, the deadlines. But just going back to the, the case management judge's decision, so she, um, she, what she did when she assessed the, the condition, she said the case had merit. In fact, that wasn't contested. So here we have the Crown initially saying you don't even have a justiciable claim to now conceding you have a claim with merit. Um, and then she said that there, the case was publicly important and, and there wasn't really much, much resistance there from the other side. Canada did argue that it wasn't that public, it wasn't that important because these issues are all getting dealt with through consultation, uh, which of course is the concern that the nation brought is that they're not getting dealt with through consultation. Um, but anyway, the court dismissed those arguments and said it was significant uh, of public importance, but where the main argument was, was on this impecuniosity uh, test. And so there the court, uh, the test for impecuniosity is whether the applicant can genuinely afford the litigation and no other realistic option exists for bringing the issues forward. So we're looking at what does it mean to genuinely afford uh, the litigation? 
And the court, the case management judge in answering that question, she looked at, um, she looked at the other needs that the nation had. And so she said, you know, on one side of the ledger, here's the nation's resources, here's what they have available to them. And then on the other side, she looked at what the needs were in the community. And there she made some very powerful findings that the nation was, you know, dealing the, that the leadership of the community is trying to manage the challenges of poverty. And that this is a really complex, um, onerous job. And it's, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a challenging job and, and that the nation is effectively operating in crisis management. And so while the nation had some available revenue that it was getting through um, impact benefit agreements, it needed that money. It needed that money to address the, the crushing issues that it faced. And she said it wasn't reasonable for the nation to use that money to litigate its Section 35 litigation. And in fact, she said if it did, it would become destitute. And she said that would be manifestly unjust. So we had that decision from her. She said we were like had to continue to contribute some money to the litigation, but that Canada and Alberta had to provide this additional concrete assistance. The Crown appealed it. And, and just again, they're, you know, they're, the order was that they pay 300,000 each a year and they appealed it. And, um, and, they, and the Court of Appeal um, in 10 days set the order aside. And the Court of Appeal said, if, if the, the test for impecuniosity uh, is if you have any funds, if you have any funds available, you're not impecunious and that you have to use all that, those funds for the litigation. And the Court of Appeals said that Beaver Lake um, was effectively not, um, well, the court recognized if you can't meet your basic needs and fund the litigation, you're impecunious. But the court said, the Court of Appeals said, um, Beaver Lake receives federal funding and that funding should be like all First Nations do. And that federal funding is enough to meet basic needs. And without, you know, in the face of evidence that clearly that's not so, but it, but the Court of Appeals said, um, because you receive federal funding, uh, your basic needs are met. So any money you have on top of that must be first used for the litigation. So Beaver Lake appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada and the court agreed to hear the appeal, which again is very rare to get the to get an appeal at the Supreme Court level. You have to show that the issue that you are bringing is one of public importance. Um, and there the court looked at the question of what does it mean in the context of a First Nation government to be impecunious? And that was the question that was, um, was debated before the, the court. And so the argument that Beaver Lake brought uh, was that in assessing whether or not a First Nation government can genuinely afford the litigation, the courts, the courts have to be realistic about the burdens and obligations on First Nation governments, and that it's not open to First Nation governments to simply exhaust all of its resources um, so that it can't meet its obligations to its community, it can't meet its obligations to third parties. It can't meet its obligations to the crown. For example, one of the funds that the crown said they should, the First Nation should use for its litigation was their consultation money. Um, and so, we, you know, we we argued that consultation is a constitutional imperative, and that for a First Nation government, that is a basic need that the nation has to be able to participate in consultation. That Canada needs consultation that the court can't say just because you have money coming in that's supposed to support your consultation, it should be diverted um, to, the, to the litigation. So the respondents argued that, um, although the respondents tempered a bit the, their test initially, they had taken a if any money test, they did recognize at the Supreme Court that their, the, the trial judge was required to determine whether or not the spending needs could reasonably be prioritized over the litigation. Um, they still said that uh, that it wasn't reasonable for Beaver Lake to to use any of the money it had um, for its purposes. That it had to it wouldn't be impecunious. It was a choice. It all came down to this language of choice 
um, and that Beaver Lake's decision to put money towards meeting the basic needs of its community um, above what the federal government was doing, so subsidizing the programs, uh, was a choice that Beaver Lake was making. And so we argued that it's not a choice if it's supporting your basic needs and that the court needs to be realistic about what basic needs are for a First Nation government. So that's what the question for the court uh, is ask, is going to be facing in their decision. Um, and the court was, was asking lots of really excellent questions about what basic needs means in the context of a First Nation government. Um, and how to set the appropriate threshold of basic needs to give guidance to the courts below who are going to be applying this test. So really the court's trying to figure out how do we articulate a test that gives enough guidance to the courts but still gives them some discretion um, and some room in their decision to make contextualized decisions about whether or not an applicant can afford the litigation. So anyway, I think I've been probably maybe taking up more time than I was allotted. So, but that's, uh, that's the rundown. I hope that was uh, helpful. And I think David's going to give some, some even more, give us some more insight um, about these types of orders and how they, how they are applied. Thank you so much, Carrie. This was great. I'm sure there are many questions um, that are percolating. Um, so I would like to now introduce David Robbins of Woodward and Company. Um, David's core law practice is focused on finding remedies for historic and ongoing crown interferences with Aboriginal occupation and use of lands and resources. Uh, his work has contributed to securing multiple victories for the Chilcotin Nation and many Raven supporters have followed what's been happening with Chilcotin Nation, including the Supreme Court of Canada's landmark judgment of June 26, 2014, uh, declaring Aboriginal title for the first time in Canada. David successfully argued before the Supreme Court of Canada for an advance cost order to Chilcotin for their title case. And he was also counsel for the original advance cost case, which Kerry mentioned, the um, um, BC versus the Okanagan Indian Band in 2003, which created the, this legal test for advanced costs. So uh, because this issue goes way beyond Beaver Lake Cree into how can any nation fund um, these humongous cases that go to run to millions of dollars with all the, the poverty their uh, financial poverty that they're dealing with and the constant underfunding by the federal government, which federal government itself has admitted. Um, so how can e this even happen um, and what would, what impact will the upcoming decision um, of the Supreme Court have on nations across the country? So, David. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm here in Victoria in my office. Um, it's uh, in the footprint of uh, old Fort Victoria, the Hudson Bay Company in the Kwangan Territory. And um, so I wanted to acknowledge the uh, the Kwangan land and territory and treaty in this area um, before speaking. I'm uh, currently counsel for the Cowichan Nation in a title and rights case. Um, it's somebody asked uh, when Kerry was speaking there, why are cases so, take so long or why are they so expensive? In large part, it's because courts are reluctant to issue um, orders based on Section 35 Aboriginal Treaty Rights without having a deep inquiry into um, the claimed rights and the infringements um, and the Crown pleadings of justification. So the Cowichan case, for example, is set for 400 days and it involves uh, 14 lawyers on my team alone. Uh, there's six defendants, 30,000 plus documents, 12 plus experts, and that's uh, been going since September 2019 after five years of pretrial work. So access to justice and affordability in the types of cases that Carrie's brought are really important issues. Um, and for, fortunately, in my case, in the couch, and they haven't applied for advanced costs, but in the past, my representation of the Tilco Teen Nation did apply for advanced costs. And so I was asked, as I understood it, to give you a little sense of uh, before we look forward into what the relate Cree's case and the result from Kerry's argument 
uh, may bring, uh, help us understand it by looking back to the Chilcotin and or Okanagan experience. So I was going to do that for some context. It's really uh, a bit of a tale about the Okanagan and the Chilcotin. Um, and I'll just start by saying this, that um, advanced costs in the Indigenous law context really started with the Okanagan case. And in that case, back in 2001, counsel for the Okanagan, who was not me, um, drew upon family law. And that's because in, in family law cases, there's a bit of a history of courts using their jurisdiction to order advanced costs in the context of marital breakdowns where spouses are litigating over a division of assets. And you may think, well, what's that got to do with Indigenous law? And, well, it's because that case law recognizes that some marriages have a very large disparity of financial resources. And so when it, it disputes arise in court about a division of assets in the context of a divorce, one party could outspend the other easily and the trial wants to ensure that there's a fair process. So um, usually it's the man who has more resources and the court uh, where there's an impecunious spouse, a female spouse generally, uh, can order advanced costs. And that was the law that Okanagan drew upon back in 2001. They were in the Court of Appeal. They were faced with the BC Court of Appeal. They had gone into their territory and started logging without authorization from BC. And BC was incensed that this logging was taking place on what they regarded as crown land uh, and taking place without their authority. So British Columbia went to court uh, and brought uh, an enforcement proceeding against the Okanagan to stop what they were doing on their land. And the Okanagan defended themselves based on a claim of Aboriginal title. So the BC said, well, this trial is going to be immense and long and complicated. Uh, let's have it. And knowing the Okanagan couldn't afford it, to which the Okanagan said, aha, we're going to bring an advanced cost application. And so they did, and they weren't successful at the lower court, but they were in the BC Court of Appeal in 2001 in the decision that's online. It's called uh, BC Minister of Forest versus Okanagan Indian Band, 2001, BC Court of Appeal 647. And in that judgment, the three judge panel said, look, um, for this Aboriginal title to be raised, uh, they need an advanced cost order. We recognize the imbalance of power in the, between BC and the Okanagan. And uh, we also recognize that this case is of public importance because it's the first Aboriginal title case since Delgamook in 1997. And that was the origins of this whole line of cases that Kerry was able to engage with in the Supreme Court of Canada recently. Um, and how that relates to the Tsilkotin is because the Tsilkotin had an Aboriginal title case at the time. It was uh, getting marching towards trial and the Crown had brought 17 pre-trial applications outspending and bleeding dry the Tsilkotin on their title and rights case. And, for which I was counsel. And the Chicotin read that judgment in Okanagan from the BC Court of Appeal and said, wait a sec, we're the first Aboriginal title case since Delgan, but it's not the Okanagan. So they brought an advanced cost order. And the trial judge in um, Tsilkotin said, yeah, we can see that the Tsilkotin are impecunious as uh, or can't afford this case. That, it, that they've spent all their money in these pretrial applications, that it's going to be a long trial, and that there's public merit to this case because Aboriginal title, there's issues that needed to be settled. There's an impasse in the BC treaty process that it, this case might be able to resolve. And so there was an advanced cost order from Justice Vickers, and that got the Chilcotin trial, um, or not underway, but it kept it from withering on the vine. And um, this is the situation that Beaver Lake Cree, I understand, found, finds themselves in. And the Crown hates the idea of advanced costs because it means access to justice for First Nations, whether it's Beaver Lake Cree or Silcotine or um, Okanagan. And so they appealed, they appealed in uh, the Chilcotin case. It got to the BC Court of Appeal in, in 2002, and we successfully um, protected that order to the Chilcotin. And so at that time in 2002, there were then 
two Court of Appeal orders, one for the Okanagan and one for the Tsilkotin for Aboriginal title cases and rights cases in British Columbia. And what happened was the, uh, the Crown appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada in Okanagan, and that's the case that went first. And as Kerry's indicated, there's a judgment from 2003 uh, called Okanagan Indian Band, where the Supreme Court of Canada laid out a three-part test for advanced costs. One is uh, poverty, two is the case has sufficient merit, and three is it's got to be uh, special circumstances. In, in, it's often uh, a case of public importance. So that is the law from the Supreme Court of Canada in 2013. It's what then got applied to the Chocotin, uh, that the Crown appealed the Chocotin case to the Supreme Court of Canada, and um, the advanced costs arguments were filed. And um, after much uh, preparation, before the oral hearing, the Supreme Court of Canada intervened in our case. The Chief Justice says, ah, we've read your, we've read your submissions. We don't think we have to deal with your case because we've already dealt with Okanagan. Sent it back to the lower court for rehearing in light of the Okanagan decision in the Supreme Court of Canada. And lo and behold, the justice in Chakotin's case uh, issued the advanced cost order again. And so that enabled the Chakotin to proceed to trial. Uh, you may ask yourself, how come I don't know about an Okanagan case of title and rights in a big decision? Well, that's because it never happened. The, in that case, BC was the uh, prosecutor and Okanagan was the defense. And as such, BC controlled the, uh, the, uh, whether that case advanced, and I don't know all the details, but the case never advanced. And so there is no de declaration or hearing on Okanagan Aboriginal title, despite the advanced cost order. But in the Chakotin case, um, it's different. The Chakotin were the plaintiffs, just like the Beaver Lake Cree are the plaintiffs. So as long as they can get funding for the case, either through an organization like Raven or advanced costs or both, then they control the litigation and they decide when the litigation gets stopped or started. And the Chicotin decided to continue through, um, through to trial. They went through trial of over 300 days between 2004 and 2006. Um, and what they got in 2007 was a judgment from the BC Supreme Court uh, acknowledging Aboriginal title acknowledging um, a, Abra a Chakotan Aboriginal right to hunt and fish and, and declaring that that Aboriginal, Chakotan Aboriginal right to hunt and trap, not fish, sorry, uh, had been infringed by forestry. And that trial decision in Silcotine about the hunting and trapping rights is a major environmental victory. It, um, is hugely positive for reconciliation with the Chicotin and setting a precedent for environmental implications for how the Crown, in this case BC, must manage land where Aboriginal rights are proven to exist and declared. So the trial court, the advanced cost order in Silcotin got this fabulous trial judgment based on uh, the rights um, and the environmental mismanagement by British Columbia. It also, but it didn't declare the title. And for that, we had to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014. And as Anna indicated, uh, we did get the Sukhothan Aboriginal title uh, declared, the parts that have been proven, which was over 17 um, square kilometers, 1700 uh, acre or square kilometer. I can't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. But it's a very large expanse of land and it basically stopped um, uh, forestry and resource extraction in Silcotine proven title lands. Um, and it, so it's, it would, again was a, another major reconciliation victory uh, and environmental victory for the Chicotin in that area. So none of that would have been possible without advanced costs. And um, it's, it, the echoes of that today are seen largely, as far as I can tell, in the Beaver Lake Cree situation. Um, uh, the, when we look forward, and I, I, 
uh, Susan sent me some questions like, what would advanced costs mean for Beaver Lake Cree at the Supreme Court of Canada? Um, Carrie would be, be better able to answer that, but from an outsider looking in, it would surely allow the Beaver Lake Cree to proceed to trial like the Tilco team did. And it would potentially, uh, it would allow for a trial judgment with a potentially important uh, reconciliation results, including environmental results, relative to the myriad of, myriad of oil sands development in Beaver Lake uh, Cree territory. So advanced costs and, and the funds people have contributed through Raven for the Beaver Lake Cree, um, just for the Beaver Lake Cree alone, would um, stand to have major reconciliation environmental benefits on the lands that are the subject to trial in a similar way that it had for Tilco team. Um, but as a precedent, uh, the trial would, would establish precedent for other treaty First Nations in Canada, whether they're fighting oil sands or cumulative impacts of some other nature from industrial development. And that, that's the core case, that the underlying case that Kerry talked about. But of course, what's the importance of the advanced costs uh, hearing that for Indigenous rights and title more generally in Canada? Well, the, the hearing that Kerry just argued, um, from an outsider looking in, it, it's got the potential for providing other First Nations with advanced cost orders against the Crown when enforcing their Aboriginal treaty rights protected under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. And that's because this test from 2003 that the Supreme Court of Canada established in the Okanagan case, it has been, it has been was construed as narrow and has been applied narrowly. It's not been used a lot, but in the Beaver Lake Creek case, the case requires the Supreme Court of Canada to, to think about that test, whether it needs amending and how it applies in the circumstances when an indigenous party like the Beaver Lake Cree have at least some financial support for the litigation. It requires, as Carrie said, a, a consideration of what basic needs mean and how this Okanagan test can be applied. And it is a, an opportunity for the court. It, it may redesign the test somewhat or apply it more liberally so that Aboriginal and treaty rights cases can be more readily brought forward. Um, the court may see this as an access for justice issues for First Nations. It may see this as an opportunity to step towards establishing a broader legal mechanism, enabling litigation to force crown reconciliation after an era of colonization. And, to for, and that means um, insofar as the indigenous uh, plaintiff wants it, um, environmental benefits as part of that reconciliation. So it's an important case. It builds on um, the precedent from the Okanagan uh, and it's like Chilcotin uh, standing to benefit not just the Chilcotin, but uh, indigenous peoples broader than that. So that's my attempt to put it in a bit of historical context and uh, film my 15 minutes of looking forward, but also looking back. So. Fabulous. Thank you so very much, David. This was amazing. And um, we have time for at least one question, but before we go there, I just want to um, give a big shout out to all of the donors to Beaver Lake Cree. We have surpassed our goal of $280,000 for Beaver Lake Cree this year uh, by $6,000. So it's just <laughs> great. Uh, we have also spent down all the matching funds that we had from a pool of generous donors. Um, so it's really a great moment um, to say thank you uh, to all the donors who gave to Beaver Lake Cree, but also to those monthly donors who give to Raven because you have enabled Raven to have an intervener fund. And from that fund, we were able to fund Treaty 6 Association to be an intervener in this case. Um, and that's a big, um, big step forward for us to be able to be nimble and uh, fund big cases like Beaver Lake Creek case, but also like those small strategic, not so costly interventions that are still costly for nations. So thank you all for that. And now uh, the first question, um, and you can choose who will answer, or maybe both of you, um, is the Blueberry case, uh, Yehi versus British Columbia, and how 
if it, and if it will have any influence on the determination of the Beaver Lake Creek case and whether also some of the pre precedents contained in Blueberry might help Beaver, the Beaver Lake Creek case to be less expensive. I'm happy to answer that. Um, and and uh, David can weigh in as well if, if there's other things to say about it. But yeah, the Blueberry River will be an important, um, provide some important guidance for be for Beaver Lake. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's a different treaty and there's different parties, obviously, and there's a different regulatory regime for um, assessing and understanding cumulative effects and whether or not the processes that the province there and Alberta have in place um, are different, but, but the certainly the courts um, findings around the promises, the oral promises that were made in the treaty and the and the core pre promises of preserving and protecting a way of life and the obligations on the crown to ensure that those um, protections remain are, are going to be really helpful guidance for Beaver Lake. The um, Blueberry case didn't deal with justification. It dealt with what the, what the treaty promised and whether there's an infringement of the treaty. Um, and, it, and then the crown actually didn't advance a justification defense and the and BC has said it won't appeal it. So there's no appellate um, decision, but, and I'm saying this because I, um, one of the re reasons for getting advanced cause too is, is there is a uniqueness component here. So, um, so uh, you know, there are some things that, per, that Beaver Lakes case continues to be unique. Um, from that perspective, but certainly that um, decision will help provide some important guidance um, for Beaver Lakes case. I think um, that what we see from that case too is how these cases can get heard when they are properly resourced. So that um, Blueberry River, to, the case took about five years from the time it was filed to, to the time it get heard. The trial itself was 160 days long. Uh, so we can see again how long these trials take to get heard. And again, they didn't even deal with, a, with a, the third issue that Beaver Lake is contending with here on justification. So it gives us a, a sense of what is going to be required um, in terms of, of potential trial time. Super, thank you. Can I just add something on? Please. Yeah, totally aside from the trial decision in Yahe, there's a really important mid-trial decision where the judge in that case uh, made an important order for access to justice. And people may not know, but um, the, it's the provinces that run trial courts and they fund them. And one of the ways, one of the things they do, particularly in British Columbia, is they have laws about court fees and in order to use a court, a plaintiff has to pay, after about five or 10 days of trial, has to pay about $800 a day just to use the court. And so um, we were in Cowichan's case, we were getting bills from the attorney general that for a 400 day trial would have amounted over $300,000 $300, just in court fees, just to use the court. And uh, there was a, in the, in the Blueberry River in Yahe, they brought an application in that case in, it's saying, um, arguing that Section 35 cases for treaty rights or Aboriginal rights in British Columbia uh, ought to be immune from these trial fees that the Attorney General of BC charges plaintiffs for using the courts. And the judge agreed and issued a declaration that in British Columbia, Section 35 court fee, uh, trials of Aboriginal treaty rights are immune from these daily court fees. And uh, BC uh, abandoned that appeal. So that's good law, totally aside from the trial decision. So at least in BC, there's immunity for Indigenous peoples bringing Section 35 cases for just the use, the fees for using the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. There was um, there was one question, and I was just that was um, about um, the litigation tactics, and I just like that's one that I really think is important for First Nations and uh, legal counsel to strategize around because 
it's interesting in the in the Supreme Court hearing, uh, one of the justices said something about abusive tactics and that there's mechanisms to deal with uh, with abusive litigation tactics by the crown. But what we see is whether or not the conduct actually rises to the level of abuse that you could actually establish it being abusive. But meanwhile, it clearly is draining the cost for the for the crown to challenge every single substantive issue and for the nation to go to court and say we want additional costs for having to deal with this and the crown saying well you know we're in litigation and we're we're entitled to pursue these defenses and yet it's it's so contrary to actually resolving these matters in a way that is sensitive to cost that is efficient and so i think it's something that I certainly know that I, I've been thinking a lot about, like how to call the crown out on that, because it does uh, suck up so much of the cost. And yet a court, you know, may not rise to the level of abuse, abusive litigation tactics, but clearly there's, it's, it's, it's um, preventing the core issues from getting heard at the expense of the of the nation. So anyway, just I raised that not with any brilliant thoughts about how to manage it or any particular precedent or case that that looks at that issue specifically. But I do think that that's a very serious and um, important thing for us to be thinking about how we can as legal counsel address that because it's a major issue. I know David, if you have maybe some more better <laughs> concrete ideas around that, but um, but it's important and it's a problem. Yeah, and it's almost itself like a cumulative impact because in none of the litigations, the conduct rises to the level of abuse, but they're actually replicating that every case, every case, every case ac across millions of cases. So yeah, I think if you would be so gracious, I would like to ask one other question that came um, in uh, was about what if the nation loses and what happens then um, in terms of the court then awarding the costs back and would they have to repay all that money? So the so yeah, I kind of answered that in the chat box that after the litigation, then every, again, the court's um, uh, discretion is is uh, exercised and the court has to look at all the factors that are available to it and deciding about costs, including conduct of the parties, including the public importance of the litigation. Um, it could be that if, you know, there was there, the uh, Court of Appeals suggested something about a set off if Beaver Lake gets damages and that Beaver Lake should have to repay. But those are all things that the court has um, is able to consider at the end of of the litigation. Certainly, we would be arguing that it's cost in any event of the cause. So the cost is being advanced under this very specific um, and unique circumstance where the nation can't afford the cost and it would be uh, punitive for the court to then order repayment when the court's already decided the costs couldn't be afforded by the nation. But but it may be even at the end, if if um, Beaver Lake wins, that they have to still pay even additional costs because it could be that the costs that were advanced don't even equal what the I mean, what the nation may be entitled to if, for example, they, they're only requiring the crown pay 300,000 each putting all the financial risk on Beaver Lake. So if the costs of the litigation are, let's say they're 1.5 million a year, then Beaver Lake has to come up with an additional 900,000. So it's not as if the costs right now are actually proportionate. It's they only, they're capped at 300,000 a year, that's it. So the award, and they're complaining about that, and saying that that's unfair to them. And we're saying that's the bare minimum out of the public purse to ensure that Beaver Lake gets some concrete assistance to have this case move ahead. The financial risk is still on Beaver Lake. Um, so it may be again, courts at the end of the proceeding consider the complexity of the matter, the conduct of the parties, the public importance of the, of the claim and, and in a retrospective way. So it's looking back at everything that happened and then deciding what's fair, including partial indemnity, or we would argue for special costs, full indemnity. Um, you know, it all depends. There's additional discretion for the court to make various cost orders at the end. Mm -hmm. This is not a. This is not intended to reflect the costs to the nation that they would get after. 
This is this is intended to provide the, the applicant with concrete assistance to ensure the matter gets heard. So it's a it's slightly different. Great. Well, thank you very, very much to all our panelists, Crystal, Carrie, and David, and everyone who attended and asked, asked questions and listened and supported Beaverly Cree through these 12 years of this case with your funds, your energy, um, your heart, your caring, your social media activity. So we'll wrap it here. Uh, thank you to everybody and have a good evening. Thanks for coming everyone. Appreciate all your support. And thanks to David and Crystal, Anna and Susan. Good night. Night. <laughs>